So the gospel exists to make much of this great Savior in your personal life. Not just out there, not in word, in concept alone, but in your words, in your hearts, in your hopes and fears. Indeed, this passage exists that you today would be washed and uplifted, that you would be filled and enthralled, that we would all have a sense of enthusiasm. You know what that word means? Theos is God. In means in. In theos means God in you. Enthusiasm means that you have something of a supernatural property, something of a supernatural power, something of an other world principle that motivates your life. And that's why this exists. It is a profound section of scripture. I, I tremble at the thought of even daring to speak on it. This is why I can't even get to the message. I'm, I'm, this is something that I tremble at. This, this, what is here is so precious. I don't think golden tongues of angels can do it justice. Paul has been speaking, and remember the flow of this now. He opens up this greatest of all letters ever written, the book of Romans, and he begins his treatise by declaring, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. So as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And he then steps away, takes the gospel and says, this is great news. I've got good news that's being revealed by God that I want you to know. It's not good law, something new for you to obey. It's good news. Something that has happened in history, in time, in place, an event you didn't do. Something that God did and he wants you to know about it and the news will change your life. But then he takes that great news and he puts it on the shelf and he spins, you know, almost three chapters saying, I've got something else we've got to talk about first. It's the bad news. Because there's a lot of people who live deluded lives. They, they walk around deluded, thinking they're okay. Thinking if they could just, you know, the way to God and the way to everlasting happiness is just an installment plan. Do a little bit of work here and there and make my payments day by day, month by month, you know. Maybe get a new plan, go to a new church. There's my installment plan, and that's how people live. They think they're okay, and they think they'll someday, if, if their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds, eh, you know, God's going let to them, let them come in. God's going to just overlook all their wickedness, and God is going to have happy fellowship with wicked people who did a few good things. So Paul says, no, 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 before you can even begin to know how great this good news is, before you can even begin to taste and see that it is good, you've got to really think about where your standing is before God, who is holy and perfect and righteous altogether. And, and, and it's too holy to even look upon sin, let alone embrace the heart of it. So we need to begin there. Paul labors to say, here's the main, here's the main issue. Every one of us, every single human being needs a righteousness from God. There is none righteous, no, not one. No one understands and no one seeks God. All humanity is corrupt and culpable. And time doesn't forgive that sin. And good works does not acquit their guilt. They stand guilty before a holy judge. 
So would you look with your eyes, please, at Romans 3 and verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, apart from God's commands to be obeyed, apart from your obedience to his command, a righteousness is available to you. It's being revealed right now in a new way. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, he says, the righteousness of God that I'm talking about is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. And that's a summary of today's message. So now join me please in chapter 4. And let's think about what indeed Paul is addressing. He's going to address. He has talked in this grand section of chapter 3. About the, the crux of the gospel. The very center of it. The intersection of his perfect justice. And his amazing grace. He presents to us the substitution of Jesus Christ, the righteous. The righteous for the unrighteous. That by faith and faith alone, nothing else in your hands do you bring. Only to the cross of Christ do you cling. By faith alone can this righteousness be yours. Now he's presented that to us. Here he's not going to argue to try to convince you that this is the truth. And he's already presented it. Now what he wants to do is clarify. He wants to expand upon it. In fact, if you were with us last time, in the last exposition, we looked at verse, chapter 3, verse 27, 8, 9, all the way to 31. Let's just look briefly and see the, the, the masterpiece that we have before us. Chapter 4 is essentially an expanding and a clarifying of those few verses. He's already given the crux of the gospel. He, then he puts a garrison, a, a guard around to say what it is not. And now he's going to expand and clarify. So you'll notice verse 27, chapter 3, verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? Take note of that word. It is excluded. By what kind of law? By the law of works. Take note of that. Now look at chapter 4, verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. So the first main point last week was pride is excluded, excluding pride. And in here, he's going to now begin by talking about, again, how faith relates to works, how it excludes pride, excludes boasting, and that's going to be chapter 4, verse 1 to 8. Oh, you'll notice also, look up at chapter 3 once more in verse 29. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Take note of that. And then toward the end, verse 30. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Well, he now addresses that second point in verse 9 of chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. Look at verse 9. Is the blessing then only for the circumcised? Are you following me? The beauty is he has this little condensed presentation following up the crux of the gospel. This is what it's not. And now he's going to spend a chapter unfolding it. There's one more, isn't there? So we've looked at how faith relates to works. Pride is excluded. We've looked at how faith relates to circumcision or prejudice, external identities. And he says that's excluded. And now, thirdly, chapter 3, 31, he shows how faith relates to law. And he talks about how though we're not justified by law, doesn't mean that we're perverse, doesn't mean that we're antinomian, that we're against the law, that we're lawless. And notice how he addresses it again, chapter 4, he follows up in the same sequence, now looking at verse 13. Oh, I said... 331, didn't I? Look at this. Do we then overthrow the law? No. Now look at 413. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the, tell me, law, but through the righteousness of faith. Beloved and friends, it's very clear. Paul is on a clear direction. He is systematically mounted the gospel, presented its center, guarded it from what it is not. And now he's going to unfold it piece by piece. We're only going to look at the first two. 
we're going to look at just the first two. And mainly, we're going to focus on what he emphasizes the most. What grabbed me, I was looking for a neat little outline. You know, you go through the text, and you're like, you know, want, what do you, at the argument, Paul, and, and, and something else grabbed me. Instead of some kind of structure, I just kept reading this word, legizomai, legizomai, legizomai. What are you telling me, Paul? So I started looking all over the place for legizomai. How, how, where does he use this word? I found out that he uses it 11 times in relation to justification or righteousness or faith. 11 times only in the book of Romans. And I found out that all 11 are in chapter 4. I then thought a little further and, and looked, wait a second. There's only three of them at the end of the chapter. You'll notice them there, verse 23, actually 22, 3, and 4, all back to back. This is chapter 4, 23, 22, 23, 24. This is why his faith was counted. That's the word legizomai. That's the word imputation. Counted, counted to him as righteous. So that means, that means eight of the total number of times, eight of the 11 are all within the passage we look at today. I think there's something there that he wants us to know by the principle of repetition. Counted, 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 counted. So, I want us to see it that way. I want us to really frame around, understand this passage with its clear crowning emphasis. From the original language, the crowning emphasis is the word in English, counted, counted. Paul thereby, with this word, is expanding and clarifying what justification means. Justification is, again, where God declares the sinner righteous. And he does so on the ground of grace, by the merits of Christ. So, here he wants to expand on that. Listen to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 33. It says, what is justification? Good place to start. Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight. Only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone, period. That's good. That is probably the best definition of justification I've ever read. So short, so concise, so carefully worded. And it has that one little term, imputed. Now, let me make sure I, I want everyone in on this. When I said legizomai, that's the Greek word. When I said counted, or you see it in the ESV, counted, that's the same word. When you hear the word imputed, that's the same word. So what does imputed mean? Well, let's take a look at just a simple definition. The idea of the word imputed means the act of reckoning a legal debt or credit to an account. What Paul is doing here is he is drawing out the significance of this one word, to clarify the meaning of justification and thereby to clarify the amazing glory and power of the gospel and to do that for the glory of Christ and your joy. So this word is emphasized here, for the glory of Christ and for your joy, I conclude. You'll notice Again, the idea of the word. Let me give you a couple synonyms that, that are roughly in the same semantic domain. They're, they're very close. The idea of accounted, counted or accounted, credited, reckoned, attributed, considered. These are all examples of financial use of the term that was often used in the marketplace in the ancient world for financial transactions. In fact, hold your place in Romans, but jump over so you can see it with your eyes to Philemon, if you can find it. Philemon, that little book of Paul that follows after Colossians, 
Look at Philemon. No, actually, after a few more. (laughs) After Titus. And look at verse 18. He wrote it when he wrote Colossians. That's where my mind was. Look at what he says in verse 18. If he has wronged you, Onesimus, so he's writing to Philemon, and he's saying, if he has wronged you at all, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. That's the word. So if he owes you anything, or if he's done anything wrong, charge it to me. That right there is really the poster of this passage. But it's not just financial, is it? And even there, it's not financial. It speaks of something legal. Imputed is more commonly used in legal terminology. Charging. It is like the sentencing. The verdict. The verdict charges. It imputes based upon guilt. So you might just take note of Leviticus 7. Leviticus 7 verse 18. If any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering is eaten on the third day, a law in God's word, he who offers it shall not be accepted, neither shall it be, here's our word, credited to him. It is tainted, and he who eats of it shall bear his iniquity. Or Leviticus 17, verse 3 says, If anyone in the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp, or kills it outside the camp, and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it as a gift to the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guilt shall be imputed. Same word, imputed to that man. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. So there's legal context. There's a guilt factor. And the charging, the crediting, the imputing is a matter of legal declaration with substantial consequence. Now, with that in mind, I think the way we can now continue from the crux of the gospel and the great exchange with Christ on the cross is radiating out and the rippling effect is felt right here and we're seeing now a clarification of justification. We're seeing now counted. So what I want us to understand is that the unrighteous are counted righteous in Christ in these ways. He's going to clarify it for us. The unrighteous are counted righteous in Christ in these ways. Number one, through faith alone. (laughs) You, You might get tired of hearing this, but this is not my opinion, and it's not Martin Luther. This is the Bible. It's actually communicating to us this grand and chief and pillar and great doctrines upon which the church stands or falls. That's Luther, but I think he's right. You get this wrong, And you get the gospel wrong. And you cannot be forgiven or have eternal life. You get this right, forever changes. So it is that important. The unrighteous are counted righteous in Christ through faith alone. How do we see that? Let's look at it together. Starting again, chapter 4, verse 1 of Romans. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham? Remember, we just rehearsed Philippians. Whatever gain I had, I count as loss. I think that's what Paul's using the word gain here. Did did Abraham in his flesh gain anything? What did he count as gain? Look what he says. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? And then he goes on. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. Now, let's just stop right there and just think about this. Abraham, oh, this is so good. This is really so good. I'm going to constrain myself. Abraham is superb for Paul to point to. This is truly the most exemplary character. The, The most ostentatious figure that he could possibly tell the Jew to look at, to support 
the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Abraham is supremely important. He is a central figure in the Bible, and he is more than an example. Sometimes we just treat him as, oh, just just an example. To the Jew, he was much more. He was the man that God called out and made a covenant with. The man who would later be called the father of the entire nation. The man upon which the Jews would identify with, even at times more than Moses. Abraham was the superlative. It is no small wonder that we see in the New Testament, Abraham is mentioned very frequently. Like, for instance, John the Baptist tells the Pharisees and scribes when they say, we have Abraham as our father. I don't need your baptism. He says, then bear the fruit in keeping with Abraham. Or in Luke 16, Jesus tells a parable about a rich man and a poor man, and he only names the poor man, which is completely countercultural. You don't name the poor people. You name the rich people. But he leaves the rich guy's name completely marked off. Insignificant. The poor man's significant. And the poor man goes to Abraham's side. And the rich man who thought prosperity was his sign of salvation instead is judged. Or John chapter 8. Jesus is talking and he's telling them, oh, if you just listen to my word and abide in my word, you'll be my disciple too. And they have disdain for him. And so to push him away with what words? We have Abraham as our father. We don't need you. Well, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, who loves the Lord Jesus Christ and is being stoned to death for his faith, he cries out, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And he goes on to talk about how Christ is the fulfillment of Abraham. My whole point in this exercise was to remind us of just how prominent Abraham fares in the scriptures in the New Testament, even in the New Testament. So we find him here, central figure, as the Gospels presented, first example, first illustration, first model, first paradigm, Abraham. Go to Galatians, first paradigm, Abraham. Go to James, and absolutely rebuking licentiousness, lawlessness among people claiming Christ, Abraham. Go to Hebrews, talk about faith. The guy who gets the most attention, Abraham. Abraham is significant. Now, that's just significant for us to see. We can see it in the New Testament. We can understand that as Christians. Abraham, you know, we even have those little songs. Father Abraham, I'm not going to sing it, but you know, Father Abraham. Because I love that little song. But Father Abraham. But here's the deal. If, if, if we know that much about Abraham, how, how significant and central do you think it was to maybe first century Jews that would read Paul's letter? How about, here's my point. They believed that Abraham was the paradigm of Israel and that he was justified by works. That's what they believed. That's what they taught. It's no small wonder Paul writes the way he writes. Look at how he writes. Verse 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? I love that too. What he's getting at there is, um, I know among you Jews, among us Jews, Paul would say, he's a Jew, that there is none righteous more than Abraham. So let's start right there. What did he gain from that? Well, listen to Jubilees 23.10. This is what the Jews wrote in between the Old and the New Testament. All of these quotations are writings from the Jews between the Old and the New Testament, which tell us what they thought when Paul wrote this. Listen to what they say. Abraham was perfect in all his dealings with the Lord and gained favor by his righteousness throughout his life. The installment plan. 
Abraham gained. That's what got me there. Because Paul used the same word. What did Abraham gain? Well, here, the Jews said he gained a righteous standing before God by his perfect dealings. It was widely held that that meant that he was justified by his works. And they did it in such a way that the way they wrote it, and some Christians think this way, that's why I'm spending time on it, is they just loosely switch between and sometimes just mutate into faith, faithful. And there's a chasm of difference. Faith is an instrument by which you receive. Faithful is the way you walk. It's a commitment. It's a loyalty. It's a devotion. It's a dedication. It's a work. So they moved from faith to faithful. Now listen to the language written again before the New Testament. First Maccabees chapter 2, verse 52. Was not Abraham found faithful in temptation and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness? There it is, black and white, right there in the New Testament writings. They're saying, yeah, Abraham was faithful. He worked and that was counted righteous. That, that was not just faith equals faithfulness, but it's also that faith thereby means merit. It means merit. It means you have a, a righteous desert, that God is your debtor. You have currency that you could say, you owe me. And let me just read that to you. This is attributed to Rabbi Shammai, who taught, by the way, uh, Gamaliel and... Uh, Gamaliel taught Paul. There's a bit of history. Rabbi Shammai says this, the faith which, with which our father Abraham believed in me merits that I should divide the sea. You hear what the rabbi is saying? What he's saying is, you know why I divided the Red Sea for Moses and all of the children of Israel? Because of the merit of, of Abraham. Sounds like the treasury of merits that we know in the Roman Catholic Church. The merits of one, I do it all for the other. Another writing, our father Abraham became the heir of this and of the coming world simply by the merit of the faith with which he believed in the Lord. This is what the Jews believed. Our Rabbi Nehemiah, he says, he who fulfills, or yes, he who fulfills a commandment in faith merits highest praise from God. Or how about the Qumran scrolls? Commenting on the prophet Habakkuk. The righteous will live by faith, they say, which when interpreted concerns all those who observe the law in the house of Judah. Did you hear all this? They're taking faith and saying what that means is it's a work of faithfulness. It means it's something you do. And if you do it well, you then are considered righteous. So Sirach 4420, Abraham kept the law of the Most High. He entered into covenant with him, sitting upon or setting upon his body the mark of the covenant. That's circumcision, by the way. And when he was tested, he proved faithful. And that's the ground of his righteousness, they claim. One more in the Talmud. So this is later in the uh, Kiddushin. Chapter 4, verse 14, we find that the patriarch Abraham kept the entire Torah even before it was revealed. Now, do we remember that, uh, you know, the law of Moses came with Moses, which was hundreds of years after Abraham? And so they say, no, he kept the Torah. He kept, are you kidding me? He kept the Torah. I know it wasn't out there yet, but he kept it. It's all righteous. I said one more. Well, here's half. The prayer of Manasseh, verse 8, says, Abraham did not sin against God. Now, I took you there because I think, again, like we need to feel the weight of our sin before we can rejoice in the grace of the gospel. So you need to see the weight of what the Jews believed about Abraham before you can sense what Paul is saying. And now with that in mind, what Paul is now saying, he is 
diabolically, directly, squarely opposing the most contemporary scholarship in his day. He's going against all the scholars. He's he's going against all that was written by the rabbis, all in the synagogues, all in the yeshavs, all the colleges of the Jews. And he's saying, no, it's dead wrong. Dead wrong. Not just a little, completely opposite. And now what I love is Paul does this not, not by his own authority, not by his own reasoning alone, but he does it by biblical exegesis. So excitedly, let's look. Verse 2. For in, if Abraham was justified by works, here he starts his, his premise. If he was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Literally, not with reference to God. You might boast about him. Nobody can boast about him before God. He can't, and none of you can. That man did not deserve a righteous title before God. That is stunning to say to the Jews. And in fact, the grammar, which I could just show you the Greek real quick, because the grammar here, this is a protasis, little Greek thing, and this here negates it. So when he says, if, this here says, no way. He wasn't justified by, by, by works. No way. Impossible. Was not just, so what's the emphasis? What's the point of this grammar? Well, it's this. Paul is effectively saying, Abraham had nothing Nothing whatsoever to boast in before God. And this again, beloved friends, this is not Paul's opinion. This is not based upon what Rabbi so-and-so said. It's not based upon a council. What does the very next verse say? For what does, tell me, the scriptures say. Oh yeah, right? And so whenever you want to go against the scholars, you better do something like this. What does the scripture say? Paul is now the exegete, and what he points to is the only true, final, lasting, and ultimate authority. He doesn't find his confidence in this truth on the basis of what rabbis have said, or what commentaries have said, or what sermons have been preached, or what masses of people believe. I pray you don't find your confidence in that either. But thus saith the Lord. And the tense of this is also a little bit striking. I don't want to press it too much. But he does say it in a way that's a bit gripping. Because he doesn't say it is written. Or it has been written. But he personifies the written word as though it's living and active. Sharper than a two-edged sword. And it's standing there speaking right now. So it stands among the rabbis. And it says, no, 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 no. I think there's also something else going on. Paul is affirming continuity, isn't he? I mean, didn't he just say in verse 31, didn't he say, we do not overthrow the law, but we fulfill it? That's in Christ. But shouldn't that also mean that Christ who gives us the word, Christ who who empowers Paul, Christ who appoints and gives his spirit to speak through Paul, wouldn't that also be, wouldn't that also be in concert with, in continuity with, and fulfilling the Old Testament, right? Here's a point. When Paul says, you know what? I'm going to start expanding and clarifying what I just said. We don't overthrow the scriptures, the Old Testament. Let me start with hmm, the Old Testament. And let me start with the first major character of any identity in this realm, anti, you know, post-Diluvian, <laughs> Abraham. Well, he's affirming continuity, and at the same time, there's something else going on I want to catch at the end, and that is that he is denying innovation. He's affirming continuity, and he's denying innovation. What, is he, what do I mean? I mean this. He's saying, boys, um, I didn't invent this. This isn't some obscure-in-the-corner idea. This is God's plan. With that in mind, what does he say? 
He says, the scriptures say this, and he quotes Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God. Let's just read this together. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. You know, the Jews used that exact text to support the things that I read before. That he was counted righteous because of his faithfulness. And they used that text. (laughs) You know what's... I'm going to explode up here. You know, the very first time in the Bible that the word believe is used, the very first time is Genesis 15, 6. Right here. You know, the, one of the very few times in the Old Testament that it's used in connection with righteousness is the very first time believe is used. Isn't that striking? And in the context of its use, There is absolutely no work, and there's no law, and there's no circumcision, and there's no obedience being commended. In fact, it starts in context with Abraham again scheming up some alternate way to accomplish the will of God, and he says, just sit down and then rise up and look at something. And believe my word. And when Abraham did that, righteous. The very first time the Bible uses the word believe is the verse that Paul quotes. And it happens to connect directly with righteousness. This is why I say it's a masterful exegesis. Paul knows exactly what he's doing. And he didn't innovate this. This is truly the mind of God. Unfolding. Through this pen. Well, you know, it does assume some familiarity with, with the life of Abraham, and I don't have time to break into all of that, but at least let me just frame briefly just four major steps in the, in the grand scheme of the life of Abraham as God portrays his life. Number one is that God calls Abraham. He calls him from idolatry, worshiping false gods in a foreign land. There was no promised land at the time. He calls him out and says, I'm going to do something for you. Okay. Step two is not only does he call him, but now God promises to him. It's in this incident, this incident, where Abraham believes the promise. And Paul's going to echo that next week in verse 13 and following. Step three would be then that the Lord confirms his promise. God confirms his promise by giving him a son, Isaac. And step four, God tests his promise devotion, his faithfulness by calling him to sacrifice Isaac. Those are the major steps in Abraham's life. What's important is to understand that what Paul is pointing to is the very thing he just preached about in the cross. And he says, this is a preceding activity of God, that God himself has already exercised this very principle of justification by faith alone. That Abraham did nothing to deserve the declaration. And he he received it because and only because he believed in the word of a promise. This, beloved and friends, is the main point. First and foremost, that the unrighteous are counted righteous through faith alone. The amazing thing is, let's think about just the scenario that I just painted with Abraham's life. You know, that many years passed between each of those steps. Many years. He was called, and over a decade passes before, that's chapter 12, over a decade passes by the time you get to chapter 15. And now he's saying, you know, I'm getting old. I can't have kids. So, you know what? My servant. Lord, just give him the blessing. And that's when God said, sit down. Listen to what I'm saying. And now get up. And go look at the stars. You see the stars? Can you count them? Because out of your loins, I'm going to give you children like that. What? And the crazy thing is, he's he's a man past the age. His wife is past the age of reproduction. He's old and ready to die. He's already talking like, give it to Eleazar. And when God says it, he doesn't squabble, he doesn't question, he doesn't push back, he doesn't rationalize, he doesn't say, well, or what do I need to do? He just says, I believe you. I believe what you said, the word, I believe the word. 
And God the Father says, you believe my word? You believe my word? Righteous. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It speaks then, obviously, of a status, right? We're not talking merits here. We're not talking something. This is status. You you have a status with me now, Abraham. And isn't it very strikingly important that everything that follows, namely the child born, namely the test of sacrifice, all were done, and circumcision, by the way, which we're going to look at, all follow, follow his faith. His faithfulness follows his faith. So faithfulness is completely incompatible with righteousness before one is counted righteous. In other words, let me say it this way. Faith is the beginning. Faithfulness is the fruit. So, what we see is this idea of exchanging here. But I want to point out one last thing. When he says, Abraham believed God. Did you notice what is not there? A two-letter word we're often used to seeing. Namely, a word that starts I and ends with N. It doesn't say he believed in God, did it? It says that he believed God. And there might not be too much here that we need to go to, but I do want to draw our heart's attention to this very important reality. Some people think that, that the idea of, of, of coming to church, the idea of the gospel, is, is that I need to believe that God exists and I'll, I'll go to heaven. No. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, no, that is demanded of you. That is only perfectly rational. That's, that's nothing of supernatural. To look at a painting and to believe there's a painter, that's not supernatural. That's just rational. To look at this building and say someone built it, that's not supernatural. That's very natural. To believe that God exists is not the issue. It's to believe God himself. Removing the prepositions means there's something of an intimacy here. It's that he's trusting. It's not an an object like he can use God. I'll believe what you say to get what I want. Tell me what to do so I can go where I want to go. But instead, an embracing of God himself. He believed God. And this personifies, oh, where Paul is going to take us. I thought... I'm low on time, but I thought I might just mention to you briefly that the Reformers had to fight this, see, because uh, the time of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church was doing the same thing the Jews were doing and say, no, no, it's about faithfulness. That's how Abraham was justified. And so they, they dealt with the scholars that were Roman Catholic and said, hey, but wait a second, didn't you teach us? I mean, because, right, all the Reformers were Catholic, like I was Catholic. That's why I can talk about it. They were, they were all Catholic, and then they came to the understanding of grace. Well, they argued, well, didn't you teach us that there are three, three essential components to faith, right? Like, doesn't the scripture say in James chapter 2, verse 19, that, you know, even the demons believe and tremble. They believe, and there's actually a consequential effect of their belief, but they're not saved. So what does faith mean? Certainly, he's not talking about the existence of God. So, so, so here's, here's the three major components. Notitia. Some call it notitia, but in the older Latin, it would be notitia. Notitia means the knowledge. The knowledge. You, have to, you can't have faith in something you don't know. You could have some knowledge about the object that you believe. So this is the propositional truth. This is, this is I got to know. I got to know what is this. This is to know. And this would be like in uh, Romans 10, 14. How, will, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have never heard? You can't believe in one you don't have notitia, you don't have knowledge of. So notitia is the first ingredient. The second ingredient that's necessary is a census. This is the word we get, uh, by the way, notitia is the word you get notion from. This word you get assent, 
intellectual assent, you come to agree. This is where the propositional truth that you know, you now actually agree with it. So not only do you know that there is mathematics, you actually believe that one plus one equals two. And you do, you believe it. You, you trust it everywhere you go. You believe that that's going to be true. That's a census. And that's an element of faith. But that doesn't save anyone. No, Titia doesn't save anyone. Knowing that God is doesn't save anyone. Believing that Jesus died for the sins of sinners doesn't save anyone. Oh, listen to me carefully. It takes fiducia. The word means trust. Trust. Not only do you believe it to exist, not only do you believe it to be true, but you trust. And you place yourself there. Fiducia is the only element the demons don't have. They have the notitia and they have the ascensus. They do believe and they tremble. They don't trust. So, Abraham believed God. And we do believe that all three were there. He trusted. He trusted. Calvin, John Calvin says, It is entirely by the intervention of Christ's righteousness that we obtain justification before God. This is equivalent to saying that man is not just in himself, but that the righteousness of Christ is communicated to him by imputation while he is strictly deserving punishment. And that brings us to our next point. First, the unrighteous are counted righteous in Christ through faith alone. And second, by grace alone. By grace alone. Look at verse 4. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And here's the point. Literally, Translating this literally would be that it's not according to charis, not according to grace, but according to debt. And here's the point. You might say, okay, well, I did some work for you and you, you owe me. Like I did it, but you didn't pay me this every second. You know, like, you, like I'm earning, let's say $10 an hour. Boy, that dates $10 an hour. And at, at the half hour, you need to drop in, you know, five dollars in my pocket. And every second, keep dropping in as, as the hour comes. Now, that, that's just preposterous, ridiculous. So what do you do? You, you work on the basis that you're going to get it. You're assuming there's, there's, it's coming. And so you're counting, you're counting on it. And Paul is saying, that's not at all what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a, a work that you're doing that God will, that God needs to pay you for. I'm not talking about a debt that needs to be, God is a debtor to none. There's, there's nothing here that he owes you. There's no debt to be paid. There's no compensation you deserve. And in fact, there is absolutely no obligation or compulsion, and even legally. But it's true, right? It's true what he says. If you worked a hard day, if you worked a hard week, maybe a month, maybe you did a job and you worked several months on the job and you haven't been paid. You could take that employer to court because it is your right. Justice demands that your wage be paid. There was a contractual agreement. You were to do the work and you were to be compensated. There is no contractual agreement with God and our good behavior. None. Paul is saying, don't think like that. When you think credit, you need to think this way. You did nothing. And faith is the instrument by which you receive everything. The key here, again, is when a man works, he deserves his wage. Romans 13, 7 says, pay to all what is owed to them. Same word. Owed. But verse 5, now. Romans 4, 5. And to the one who does not work. Now, what he's, he's still the illustration. Guys have gone off the curve on this. They just fly off the road. It's ridiculous. He's not talking about us being lazy. No, no, no. He's still talking about the illustration. What's the point? What is the illustration? It's a guy working to get paid. In other words, when he says, 
And to the one who does not work, he's saying, and to the person who is not seeking to earn his salvation. And the person who is not seeking to earn status before God. To the one not seeking to earn, but instead believes in him. And what is highlighted? I love this. (laughs) I love this. Because he doesn't say believes in and then he gives the gospel. He just says believes in him. In other words, he's stressing again, highlighting again the nature of God. It's this God, like more, like Moose says, this God who is loving and freely giving and incapable of being put under obligation to any human being. It's this God. You believe in this God? Counted righteous. This God who is loving and freely giving, who justifies the ungodly. And I think right there, he, it's succinct, it's bold, it's compendious which means it's comprehensive and concise at the same time. He takes in what he just gave in the crux of the gospel and he says it in just a few words. This God justifies the ungodly. And what does that say? It says that the unrighteous are counted righteous by grace because they're ungodly. What does that say? It says in the example that Abraham was ungodly because God justified him. But it wasn't because of a work that he earned. It was by faith. He uses the same word. He believed. And he was ungodly. In fact, esabes, that word is for worship. And when you put the alpha prefix there, it means you reject or refuse to worship God. That's the ones he justifies. The ones who reject and refuse to worship God. He justifies them. Now this would be, this would be too much. I dare say it would be too much. But I think Spurgeon nails it when he says to believe. We are to believe not in a savior of saints, but in a savior of sinners. Stifler says this, Abraham stood before God in his sins. They were not forgiven. God made him a promise that was against human reason. And the patriarch put his trust in it. And he relied upon it. And now, on the condition that trust in God's word, God pronounced him no longer guilty of sin. He had not uttered a prayer. He had not done a religious deed. He was not a good man. He was ungodly. Yet justified. Beloved and friends, this is the gospel. For in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is the gospel. The gospel reminds us that You're counted righteous only ever by grace and by grace alone. It is nothing we deserve. All of our righteousness is as unclean, filthy, polluted garments. His righteous, again, his faith, he goes on, his faith is counted as righteousness. Now, this is important. He's not saying that the faith itself is is somehow currency. He's not saying that... He's saying that faith is qualitatively distinct from any human merit, qualitatively different than any work, qualitatively different than what any human can endeavor to do or accomplish. Faith effectively is saying, I can't, you can, I trust you. Right? I can't have children, you can make me have children, I trust you. That's what faith is. So it's not saying, okay, The gospel is not saying what God said to Abraham is not saying, well, you've done okay, and you need a little faith to make up where your works lack. But you know, some Christians live like that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you're ungodly, you're guilty, and faith itself does not constitute righteousness. In fact, I would say it this way. Faith does not contribute 
to our justification. It's the conduit. It doesn't contribute. It's the conduit. You know, you hold up a check, a paper check, and although the buying checks anymore is ridiculous in price, there was a day where it was, you know, like less than a penny. On the check, you could have millions of dollars written. But the little thing that you're holding, that's like faith. It's nothing. That's nothing. It just points to the account. The account has everything in it. Or how about a credit card? I pull out a piece of plastic. And, and if, if, that, if the account that it points to is, is, a, is a grand account, well, then, then the credit card has some value. And you might say, ooh, but not in itself. It's not in itself. In fact, I could bluff you. I could get one of those temporary credit cards, those little cash cards, and it might have three cents on it, and I can hold it up. And it's meaningless. It's meaningless. So the, the key is, what does the faith point to? That's where the value is. And it's not in the thing that points to it. It's in what it points to. So that's the point here. He's not saying that faith itself is what we have to have faith in. Like I, I value my credit card because of the plastic. It's, that's insanity. Not at all, right? No, faith is not a work, but the soul's act of receiving Christ. So he's not saying that faith equals righteousness. He's not saying that faith is a substitute for works. He's not saying that faith is faithfulness. He is saying that salvation is by grace and grace alone and nothing, nothing else ever did or ever will save. And the only way to receive this grace is through faith and faith alone. It's an account, like Luther would cry, extra nos. It's a righteousness outside of me. It's a righteousness outside of me. It's in an account somewhere. And I need to get access to that account to be righteous. And the way I get access to that account is by faith. And faith is the medium. It's the means. It's the instrument. It's the channel. It's the conduit. It's the straw by which I drink living life, living water. It's, it's my way, my, my only means to, a, to tap in to the account of Christ. And by this faith and this faith alone, I'm counted righteous. I'm counted right with God. You know, it was said that after the Reformation, you know, the Reformers had a heart for evangelism. And they would go, there were communities of Jews at the time. We often don't think about it. And they went to the Jews. And they preached these things. And I, and I record to you, and I quote, a recorded response was this. Every fox must pay his own skin to the slayer. I'll have none of this. Every fox must pay his own skin. No, you will never, ever be righteous in that way. And so, one last little illustration I just chuckle at is uh, at the Reformation, there was a bishop who knew Greek. Didn't really pay much attention to the Bible until Luther... And once Luther started pounding justification by faith, he set out to disprove him. He's reading along, and he's reading, he comes across this passage. In fact, it comes right here to verse 5. And he stops, and he screams, and he takes the Bible and throws it. That's expensive back then, and he throws it. And he cries out, O oh, Paulus! And to quoque Lutheranus factus es. What does that mean in Latin? Oh, Paul, are you in fact a Lutheran too? <laughs> what? Can you believe it? It's always been there. The truth, like Romans 10.10, 10, if you believe with your heart, you're justified. For with the heart one believes and is justified. Well, I must hurry on to the last point. I'll do this and I need to do it in a minute. So here we go. Twofold. I need to end it with this. Uh, unrighteous are counted righteous in Christ in a twofold transaction. 
What am I saying? Imputation, crediting, being counted is twofold. And how do I get that? Well, let's look at this again. Not only has he talked about the most illustrious, the most illustrious figure of Abraham, but Paul is not satisfied to stay with Abraham. He moves on. And what does he say in verse six? Just as David, oh, David, the most celebrated king of Israel, the sweet psalmist of Israel, David, you're going to try to convince me now through David. That imputation, that being credited, counted righteous is by faith alone? Yes, you're going to do that. And Paul says, yes, I'm going to do that. And he uses a bit of a rabbinical, a rabbinical method here to, to quote the Torah and then go on and support it with something else in the Neveim or the Ketuvim. And now he says, blessed, he quotes it, the Psalm, Psalm 32, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Beloved and friends, I, I must hasten to this. Do you see what he just did? This is profound, what he just did. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And then he follows it up with, blessed is the man against, against whom the Lord will not count his sin. What's amazing. So far, all he's talked about is the righteousness of Christ being counted to you. And now he says, it's not just that. It's also the other way. The righteousness of Christ counted to you and your filth counted to him. It is a double transaction. It is a double imputation. Faith is the channel by which I have my guilt lifted off of me. My sin, my desert lifted off of me and placed upon Christ on the cross. And through the same channel, he echoes back his righteousness. He doesn't simply give me righteousness commingled with my wickedness. He covers me. He removes my righteousness. Luther struggling to find an illustration, going through the city um, of Wittenberg, and it's snowing in Germany. And as you walk from Erfurt and round, you'll see there's, you know, they had the big dung piles. That means manure. And it stinks. And they're huge. They didn't have cars. So you're walking by, slow rate, and the smell stays with you. And he sees these dung piles all over along the walkway there. And one day he's, he's racking his brains and he says, oh. And he just, he looked up to heaven and he declared, oh, that's what it's like. Being justified by faith in Christ is like him raining down from heaven this wonderful, thorough layer of pure white snow. And it covered all the dunghills. He no longer saw what was ugly and gross. And he no longer smelt what was repulsive. He now saw something beautiful. And he said, that's what it is to be in Christ, to be imputed with his righteousness. He covers all my filth. And in the process and as a consequence, he will actually renovate it so that it no longer, like it was said, oh, then what you're saying is it's just a white glove over a filthy hand. No, 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 no. Unless that white glove can transform the hand in time. Because the point is, like the snow will wash away and change the formation and seal away the sin so it doesn't continue to reek in your life. Christ covers you. You are justified completely. Your sins are not counted. And instead, you are counted righteous. Your sins are not counted against you. In Christ, you are counted righteous and your sins are not counted against you. Can I say it again? Your sins are not counted against you. Your sins are not counted against you. Your sins are not counted against you. Your sins are not counted against you in Christ. And in Christ, you all are counted. In Christ, you are counted right with God. Right. And what he does next, let me just read it and I'll explain my last comment. Verse 9, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also the uncircumcised? For we say that 
faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness, how then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that, had, that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. So the righteousness, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father, notice this, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. A little bit of a complicated passage. Let me just explain it in just a couple sentences. Before Abraham could do anything, by obedience or by ritual, he was counted righteous. And God did that because God had a plan way before Israel, way before Adam. In fact, before the foundations of the world, that those who are sinful and unfaithful and refuse to worship him, that he would set his loving heart upon you. And though you would not seek him, he would seek you. And he would use Abraham to raise up a people so that through his seed, a Messiah would come, a Savior who would be the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. There's only one way of salvation and it precedes Israel, precedes circumcision. And therefore, Paul's point is, don't look to Abraham, but look to the faith that counts you righteous, and thereby look to Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace you've shown us to just think upon these things. Remind our forgetful hearts of the tremendous wonder of what it means to be counted righteous. And remind us that though it be entirely and completely and exclusively free for us, it is infinitely and immeasurably costly for Christ. And so stir our hearts to value him and may the relevance of this glorious gospel find its expression in our thoughts today, in our words, in our ambitions, in our lives. For your glory and indeed for our joy. Amen.